Hey guys, it's Keena Music. In this video, I'll be talking about an alphabet I created, going through it letter by letter. It is so efficient that it cuts out around 20% of the characters in a passage, on average. First up, why make a whole new alphabet when we already have a perfectly good one? Well, there we go. That's the ticket. Our Roman alphabet is not, in fact, quite as perfectly good as you might think at first. Take spelling rules, for instance. When you stop and think about it, doesn't it seem quite odd that multiple letters are needed to convey just one sound? Like sh, th, and n? And about that old saying, I before E except after C? I mean, that's just weird. Not to mention that O-U-G-H can make seven different sounds. Enough, cough, plow, hiccup, although, thought, thoroughly. I mean, why is hiccup even spelled that way in the UK? Really, the fundamental issue with the Roman alphabet is that it imposes roadblocks that need not be imposed. And even though these roadblocks are small, they're quite numerous. And throughout the day, if you do a lot of reading, this includes any reading, including signs, web pages, billboards, and even this text on the screen right now, that's a lot of brain power that's being used for reading. It doesn't have to be used for just reading. As a solution to this problem, I suggest a new alphabet, a phonetic one, which uses exactly one grapheme, letter, for one phoneme, sound. I call this alphabet Inglophone because I designed it specifically for English, being an English speaker myself, and because it's a phonetic alphabet. So now we've answered why. Now let's answer what. What would a phonetic alphabet look like? How many letters would it have? How would it be sorted? Well, it turns out that in English, we have 38 unique letter sound pairs. We'll get into what those 38 are later, but right now we're not getting super detailed. The 38 letters can be split into these five groups. Plosives, fricatives, liquids, nasals, and vowels. Now, how should we sort these letters? The way the Roman alphabet is sorted is, in my opinion, terrible. The only reason it doesn't seem terrible at first is that we've just gotten so conditioned and used to it that it just seems natural. Let's take a look at the first section of it. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know. I mean, why is it even ordered that way? We have a vowel, followed by a plosive, followed by an I don't know what, C could be either a plosive or a fricative, followed by another plosive, followed by a vowel, followed by a fricative, followed by yet another plosive. It's confusing, counterintuitive, and convoluted. It just doesn't make sense, and I strongly suspect that ancient Bob just went, hmm, let me think, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, almost forgot about that one, uh, G. Larry, you writing this down? Larry just wrote it down and forgot about it. So now we know the general stuff. Let's jump into the details. Uh, before we get into it though, here are a few things you should know. A grapheme is a unique letter symbol. These are all the same grapheme, just represented in different ways. A phoneme is a unique letter sound. Here are some examples of different phonemes. A digraph is two graphemes used to represent a single phoneme, like sh, th, n, among others. I tried to keep the letters as Roman looking as possible for ease of reading. The Shafian alphabet was great and all, but its one fatal flaw was that it was just too different to work. Our Roman alphabet conditioned brains just couldn't put up with that much novelty. I am not doing upper slash lowercase letters in Inglophone because I feel like it generally adds confusion. Lowercase b, p, q, and d are the same symbol, just flipped in different ways. There are two ways of writing a lowercase a, and both of them are different from an uppercase a. The Russian alphabet doesn't have cases, and it seems to work fine. Okay, so now to just get our bearings as to how we even wound up with this insane mess that we have now, let's just jump into a brief history of the Roman alphabet. In ancient Rome, the modern alphabet that we use today was created, at least its ancestor was. You see, it took about two and a half thousand years to get to its present condition, and it definitely shows once you get a little closer. The ancient Romans had it way worse than we do, because they only had 23 letters, and the ones they were missing were critical. They had no J, U, or W. The letter I would stand in for J, and the letter V would stand in for U and W. That's why today in museums, you'll see some ancient Roman coins that say Iv lives on it with a picture of Julius Caesar. 
Julius was probably the worst possible name to have in ancient Rome because literally half of the letters were switched out. Fast forward to the Middle Ages, sometime between 500 and 1200 CE. About half a dozen letters were added at that point, including J, U, and a predecessor of W called Win. But they also had two other letters that we would do well to have today, Ev and Thorn. Ev made the th sound, found at the start of them, and Thorn made the th sound, found at the start of Theodore. Those are two different sounds, which we'll get to later. In the years between 1200 and 1700, however, most of these medieval letters disappeared. The only ones that we're left with today are the now common J, U, and the modern W. And that's how we got our 26 letter alphabet. Now, this alphabet might have suited the ancient Romans just fine, but it barely cuts it for modern English. Windows 98 barely cuts it on a modern PC. I mean, you can finagle it to make it work, but who would willingly use it on a brand new computer? First up, there are some letters that are completely unnecessary and can be removed without making much of a fuss. Three, to be exact. They are C, Q, and X, and all of them just copy other letter sounds. C copies the K sound, like in cup. It can also copy the S sound, like at the start of circle. So C is completely unnecessary. Next up, Q. Q copies the K sound, like in quiche, quack, quarrel, etc. Lastly, X. Now, X is a weird one because it copies multiple sounds, but not in the same way that C does. It copies them at the same time, all encompassed within one letter, rather than like on different occasions like C does. X can copy KS, like in extra, GZ, like in example, KS, like in anxious, and Z, like at the start of xylophone. There's probably more that I just haven't thought of yet, but this is enough incriminating information that we know that X needs to spend some time in the can. Now that we've gotten rid of all of the unnecessary letters that are just polluting our beautiful alphabet, let's add some necessary letters that we don't have. But uh, let's get a change of scenery, because this sun is starting to get hot. First up, the plosives. There's no particular reason I can think of for the plosives coming first, I just kind of thought of it. Like Larry. But at least the letters are sorted in some way, rather than just completely mixed up and scrambled, like eggs in an omelet. Now, what are plosives? Plosives are sounds made by building up air and then releasing it somewhat violently all at once. There are nine plosives and they are p, b, t, d, k, g, ch, j, and r. A good way to remember this is that plosive starts with a p, which is itself a plosive. With the exception of r, all the plosives come in pairs of voiced and unvoiced sounds. Now, what does voiced and unvoiced mean? Voiced and unvoiced are just fancy words for whether or not you're using your vocal cords or glottis when making the sound. If it's voiced, then you are using your vocal cords and you can pronounce the sound with a definite pitch, like b, d, g, and j. Unvoiced means the opposite. You're not using your vocal cords and you cannot pronounce the sound with a definite pitch, like p, t, k, and ch. Now, all of these sounds already have symbols, except for ch and p. Let's add some symbols for those sounds. Note, j and ch are actually affricates, which means that there are two sounds smooshed together so tightly that you don't usually notice it. If you say j or ch really slowly and deliberately, you'll notice that j is actually d, j, d, j, d, j. And then ch is really t, sh, t, sh, t, sh, t, sh, t, sh. But since these sounds are so ubiquitous in the English language, on both sides of the pond and the other pond, I'll keep them in. Lastly, we have uh, aka the glottal stop, and that sound has no pair. It is made by the vocal cords, remember glottis, that's why it's called the glottal stop, starting up or stopping again. It can be found in places such as the hyphen in uh-oh, and at the start of pretty much every word that begins with a vowel, like umbrella, honesty, ambulance, and egg. Side note, to be perfectly honest, I can't tell if uh is voiced or unvoiced, so please let me know your opinion in the comments. Before we move on, just one final note about the glottal stop. In Anglophone, we usually won't write it at the start of words that begin with a vowel sound. This is for two reasons. One, it would get tedious having to write the same symbol at the start of so many words. And two, a body of text in Anglophone would be significantly harder to read because so many words would look the same when you scan it. Here's a quick explanation of why so many words would look the same. There's a thing called typoglycemia that says that the reading of most words is dictated by the first and last letter in each word. Take this example for instance. 
You could probably read that somewhat easily, even though most of the words were misspelled, because the first and last letters of all the words were left completely untouched. That's typoglycemia. Alright, that took way longer than I was expecting. Let's jump back into it. Next up are the fricatives, and these are made by letting out a constant stream of air. Next up are the fricatives, and these are made by letting out a constant stream of air. This naturally results in fricatives being somewhat quieter in volume than the plosives. A good way to remember this is that fricative starts with F, which is itself a fricative. Like the plosives, there are nine fricatives. F, v, s, z, sh, z, v, f, and h. Also like the plosives, all but H are in pairs. There are voiced, v, z, z, and v, and unvoiced, f, s, sh, f, and h sounds which has no pair, is made in the same part of the throat that uh, is made in. Now, only five of these sounds have letters, so let's add letters for the four that don't. Let's use a Greek theta for th, a medieval eth for th, an esh for sh, and an ej for z. By the way, I did not create these characters. These are from the IPA, and they were designed specifically for the sounds that I'm using them for. So I don't take credit for the symbols, but I do take credit for compiling it and jackdawing this alphabet together. Uh, by the way, if you don't know, a jackdaw is a bird that uh, takes like scraps of stuff and makes a nest. So that's kind of what I was doing with this alphabet. Uh, side note, usually in English, we use the digraph th for both the th and the th sound. Like Theodore sounds with a th sound, but them starts with a th sound, and yet we use the digraph th at the start of both of them. This can throw a bit of a wrench into the system, but this just means that you have to be extra careful to spot th versus th when writing an anglophone. I, I think that's enough said about fricatives. Let's move on to the liquids and nasals. But uh, let's get another change of scenery. This is, uh, we've been here long enough. Let's go. Okay, liquids and nasals. We can put these together in the video because there are just so few of them. There are four liquids and three nasals. Liquids are kind of the catch-all miscellaneous box. There isn't really a core principle tying these letters together, other than they don't really fit anywhere else. I would say, however, that they are kind of like half consonant, half vowel in some ways. The four liquids are l, r, w, and y. We already have symbols for these, so all good there. Next up, the nasals. Like the name suggests, these sounds involve some airflow through the nose. That's why when your nose is plugged or clogged, you know, we say your voice is nasally. The three nasals are m, n, and n, like at the end of king. Let's use the ang symbol for n. Again, I didn't create that and it was designed just for this sound. <sighs> they love it. By the way, have you noticed that plosive started with a p, which is a plosive? Fricatives started with an f, which is a fricative. And now liquid starts with L, a liquid, and nasal starts with N, a nasal. This doesn't hold for vowels, but it's still a fun way to remember the different types of letters. Now, the vowels. These are more difficult because some of the sounds that we consider to be vowels in their own right are really sort of more vowel affricates. Two vowel sounds smush together. I decided to include three of these because they're so common in the English language. I, like at the start of island, A, like in baby, and O, like at the end of go. I is really ah, like the O in Bob, gliding into E, like the double E in B. Ah, E, ah, E, ah, E, ah, E, ah, E. A is really eh, like the E in bed, gliding into E, again, like the double E in B. Eh, E, eh, E, A. A, A, and O is really a, uh, like the U in bug, gliding into U, like the double O in boot. A, uh, U, O, 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 O. These aren't the only vowel affricates, though. There is also OI, like in boy, for instance, which is O, as in go, gliding into E, like in B. O, E, OI, 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 O, E, OI. Maybe in Anglophone version 2 this will become a letter. Anyway, I've discerned 13 vowels that are unique enough from each other to warrant their own letters. They are a uh, as in bug, a uh, as in bog, i uh, as in big, e as in b, u uh, as in book, o uh, as in go, 
U as in loop, I as in kite, O as in poor, A as in apple, A as in pay, A as in guitar, and E as in bet. Let's add symbols for these. I chose to use a schwa symbol, upside down lowercase e, for the uh sound, an uppercase Greek pi symbol, the one you're familiar with is the lowercase, for the ah uh sound, an upside down capital T for the i uh sound, a symbol resembling a plus sign for the e sound, an o with a vertical line through it, similar to the Russian letter for f for the u uh sound, a regular old o for the o sound, a regular old u for the u sound, and a regular old lowercase i for the i sound. Uh, the reason I chose lowercase is to differentiate it from just a regular old vertical stroke, so I added that little dot at the top. A lowercase Greek sigma for the o sound, a regular old a for the a sound, an uppercase Greek delta for the a sound, an uppercase Greek gamma for the a sound, a regular old e for the e sound. I gotta get some shade, the sun is beating down on me again. This time it's gonna be a different shade though. Now we've got our 38 letters. Let's recap. We went through a very brief history of the modern English alphabet and how it got here, all the way from ancient Rome. We kicked out the three unnecessary letters, C, Q, and X. You see, they weren't paying their rent. Next, we rectified ancient Bob and Larry's mistake by organizing them by type and adding new letters for letterless sounds. And now we're here. Thanks for sticking with me this far in the video. All right, before we end this video, this is my first conventional YouTube style video. So there is some housekeeping I should take care of. Firstly, I don't intend to do any sponsorships. Honestly, I don't think anyone really watches that segment. I personally don't. I just click to another video, I skip to the end of that segment. And really, this channel is mostly just a way for me to share my fun projects with the internet. Money is more of a secondary thing. Secondly, I absolutely will not employ you to like, subscribe, and hit the bell. It only detracts from the experience of the video, and detracting from the experience of the video is like the last thing I want to do, except for maybe going to one of those paintball places. That sounds absolutely miserable. That said, it does tell the algorithm that you enjoy my stuff, so if you enjoyed my video, do consider liking it. Also, about this video, for the foreseeable future, I plan on having an Anglophone video every May. There will for sure be one next year. This is because I will definitely end up thinking of more letters that should be added in, some symbol changes for readability, you know, etc. I first thought of Anglophone in January of this year, and you would be surprised at how many changes it's undergone since then. Actually, the script I'm reading is like version 8.0. <laughs> uh, I've had so many scripts, it's ridiculous. Alright, now that I've gotten that taken care of, this video is done. Thanks for watching and I'll see you later.